today I'm going to talk about a relatively new technology that we've added to our custom antibody service, which allows us to rapidly convert the formats of the antibody that we generate. So as a brief overview, I want to give you a very brief um, introduction to the technology itself that we use to generate custom antibodies, to talk about how we can manipulate the conditions by which we do the library screen to generate highly specific antibodies to meet customers' requirements, to touch on the new technology and, and how it fits and how it works and what it enables us to do, and then to talk about the different antibody formats we can generate using this technology and how they work in um, in sort of applications that are relevant to drug development and bioanalytical studies, et cetera. So to start off with, our custom antibody service is built around a phage display human antibody library called HUCAL. HUCAL stands for Human Combinatorial Antibody Library. So this is essentially a gene library and the genes encode um, antibody fragments and it's the antibody fragments that specifically bind the target. Those are the fragments that we express. These are called the FAB fragments. FAB stands for fragment of antigen binding. So essentially it's the variable regions of the antibody and the first conserved regions of the antibody that comprise the FAB. So in this, in this slide, what you're looking at is you're looking at the, the genes that encode these regions of the antibody. So you're looking at the gene level. And what we have first of all is the frameworks um, of the antibody. We have seven variable heavy master gene frameworks, which basically encode the variable region of the heavy chain. And we have um, six variable light um, master genes that encode the variable region of the light chain of the antibody. So what we have is essentially 42 framework combinations and these framework combinations sort of cover most of the diversity you see in, in mankind um, in terms of antibodies, about 95%. And then at the, at the gene level, we have um, restriction sites at the CDR boundaries. So CDR boundaries or CDRs are complementarity determining regions. They're the, the parts of the gene that encode the hypervariable regions or the binding loops. And it's these binding loops that give individual antibodies their specificity. So we have um, a system of pre-built CDR cassettes. And the diversity in these comes from a process called trinucleotide mutagenesis where we essentially use a master mix of codons at each amino acid position to reproduce the amino acid distribution you see at that point in nature, essentially. So as you can see from the way I'm describing this library, it's, it's fully synthetic. It's not an amplified immune repertoire from a human or a, an immunized animal. This is, this is fully synthetic. There's no immunological bias and it's undergone no process of tolerization. What it is, is it's hugely diverse. It's about 10 times the size of a normal immune repertoire. It has about 45 billion different antibodies. So what we say to customers is that the antibodies you need will be in the library already probably, and they've always been in there since the library was made. We just have to go into that library and identify the genes that encode the antibody fragment, which recognizes your protein. And to do this, we use a process called phage display. So at its most simple, phage display is a link between genotype and phenotype. It's a physical linkage between these. So in terms of the phenotype, we have essentially the functionally binding antibody fragment protein displayed upon the surface of the phage. And then within the phage genome, or the phage mid as it's called, we have the DNA sequence of that particular antibody fragment. The antibody fragment itself displayed upon the phage is functionally binding. So what we can do is we can take the customer's protein of interest or their antigen, the, the protein they would use in an immunization if they were doing it in an old school way. We can immobilize that antigen. We can put our library of 45 billion different phage displaying antibodies onto it. We wash away the non-binders, we recover the binders, we propagate the mini coli, we harvest and we repeat. So we do this in a three round enrichment reaction. And Essentially what this does um, is it enriches for antibodies displaying fabs that recognize the protein of interest. At the end of that, we'll go from our 45 billion down to a, a much smaller and rich library of tens of thousands of clones. And then we can pick individual clones from that, sequence them, and then we have the DNA sequence of the antibody that recognizes the customer's protein essentially. But it's a bit more sophisticated than that because it's a because it's an in vitro process, we can really get in and we can manipulate the conditions by which we screen a library. And we have a number of different strategies for doing this. The most popular strategy and the most common one we use is the blocking strategy or the epitope specificity strategy. So in this scenario, you have your target protein. So this is shown, um, it's this blue antigen here, and you have a closely related antigen. So this is something very similar. 
but you don't want to have cross reactivity to the closely related antigen in this scenario. So you want an antibody that can discriminate the antigen from the closely related antigen. So in this scenario, we would immobilize the target antigen, and then we'd use a higher concentration of the closely related antigen in the solution phase. So because we're using a higher concentration, any phage displaying antibody fragments that are cross reactive will sort of be competed out by the closely related antigen. And because that closely related antigen is not immobilized, it will be lost during the wash step. So when we do this across all three of our enrichment rounds, what, what they'll do is it'll deplete the library for all those cross reactive antibody displayed on phage. And it will leave us with phage displaying antibody fragments that recognize features that are uniquely present on the target antigen. And as I said, this is just one of a number of strategies we use and one of the um, responsibilities of myself and my team is to is to put one or more of these strategies together to come up with an overall library screening strategy to deliver the, the success criteria of the, of the customer. So one area we have particular expertise is in generating anti-idiotype antibodies. So an anti-idiotype antibody is an antibody that recognizes unique features on another antibody. And really most, almost all of these are anti-idiotypes against biotherapeutic drugs. So you have your biotherapeutic drug here shown in gold, and then you have the anti-idiotype shown in purple. And not only are we able to generate anti-idiotypes, um, but we're also able to generate different classes of anti-idiotypes. And it's important to customers to have anti-idiotypes because anti-idiotypes allow you to measure a therapeutic drug antibody in a background that's going to contain a lot of other human antibodies, such as a human serum sample. In the next slide, I'll talk about how we have the different strategies to generate the different anti-idiotype classes. But I just want to describe those classes first and, and tell you what they're used for. So the most common one we're asked for is what we call the type 1 anti-idiotype. So this is um, generating anti-idiotypes to the binding site of the drug antibody, essentially, or it's called the paratope. And most unique features of any antibody are, are in the paratope because that's where all the hypervariable regions are. So the utility of a type 1 anti-idiotype is firstly that you can use these as capture and detection reagents to measure free drug in, um, you say, a human serum sample. And the other application is that they're often neutralizing the fact that they bind the binding site of the antibody means that binding site is then blocked, so the drug can't bind its target. And these, these are relevant in immunogenicity assays, anti-drug antibody assays, where really what you want to do is simulate an immune response to the drug that the patient might be having. So that's the most popular one, but customers also ask us for type two anti-idiotypes. So a type two anti-idiotype will be targeted towards unique features on the antibody that are outside of the antibody's binding site. And the reason customers often need these is because the drug that they're developing might recognize a, a drug target that's present in the serum. And if, if that's the case, if the drug target is present in the serum and you're looking at a serum sample, then the drug might not be in the free state. The drug might be in complex with its target. So the, the antigen binding site will be occupied by the drug target and then a type one anti-idiotype won't be able to bind. So what the type two anti-idiotype enables the customer to do is to measure total drug. It'll measure the drug regardless of whether the drug is free or in complex with its drug target. Then finally, we have the type three anti-idiotype and the type three anti-idiotype is complex specific. So the type three anti-idiotype will not measure, uh, it will not bind the drug and it will not bind the drug target in isolation, but what it will bind is those unique epitopes that exist when the drug target is in complex with the drug antibody. So essentially it's that junction between the drug target and the drug antibody that the type three anti-idiotype will recognize. So with the type one, two and three anti-idiotypes, what we can essentially provide is a toolbox to customers to measure free total and bound drug. The way we do this is we have a couple of strategies um, and we call it inhibitory and non-inhibitory selection. So the color scheme, again, the drug is shown in gold and this time the white antibodies, these are isotype controls. So they'll be so that either germline matched to the drug antibody provided by the customer or they'll be the same immunoglobulin subclass, same kappa lambda isotype as the, as the drug antibody. And we also use human serum at this stage at five or 10% because that's very rich in antibodies. But essentially what we would do um, for an inhibitory strategy is we would immobilize the drug on a solid surface like a bead. And we would block with an isotype control and human serum. 
so that any antibodies that recognize something that's common, like the FC, are blocked out, and any antibodies that recognize something unique, like the paratope, are enriched. And this, this is the way we generate type 1 antidiotypes, and we have a very high success rate because it's the paratope is a large target area for us to go after. But if we're going to generate type 2 and type 3 antidiotypes, we need to also incorporate non-inhibitory strategies. So with non-inhibitory strategies, we don't immediately immobilize the drug antibody. What we do is we immobilize first the drug target at a relatively high concentration. And then we cope with the, or we add then the drug at a relatively low concentration. So this gives us confidence that all of the binding sites of the drug antibody are occupied. Because if we had any free binding sites, we might generate inhibitory antibodies in a non-inhibitory screen. So with the non-inhibitory screen, Essentially, what this does is this, this forces the selection, because, because the blocking exists again, it forces the selection to unique features on the drug antibody that are outside of the, um, outside of the binding site. So to generate a type 2 antidiotype in our three enrichment rounds, we would alternate between inhibitory and non-inhibitory um, strategies so that we get an antibody that recognizes both the free and the complex version of the drug. The type three antidiotype, which is complex specific, it's slightly different. We use non-inhibitory screening again. So we always screen on the complex, but we will block alternatingly in different rounds between the components of the complex. So we'd block say in rounds one and three with the drug antibody and in round two with the drug target. So thereby we make sure we don't get any antibodies that recognize the components in isolation, but they do recognize the complex. Um, so this is a, a schematic of how we used to do things um, and all of the sort of flexibility and versatility in this schematic really is built into here, which is in how we sort of manipulate the conditions of the library screen to generate high specificity, as I discussed in the previous slides. After this, there's a subcloning step and what we used to offer the customer was choice, but we didn't offer them much versatility in terms of converting format. So before the project, the customer would choose a list of antibody from a list of antibody formats, they'd select the format they wanted. And then we would subclone from a basically a phage vector into an E. coli expression vector, and the customer would receive all of the clones from that project in that format. Um, what we do now though, we have this new technology, and this slide's a little bit scrappy, but Essentially, what we do is in, in almost all of our projects now, we make the antibodies in one particular format. And that format's a monovalent fab, so it's one binding arm, and it features something called a spy tag on the C term of the heavy chain. And this allows us to very rapidly convert the format at the protein level after we've made the antibody. And I'll describe how all this works in the next few slides, but the reason, one of the really good reasons to do this is to do with affinity work. Um, so just to explain, if you want to get nice, clean affinity data, you should work with a monovalent fab because then you're looking at essentially one binding site interacting with more, more one molecule. And we can incorporate affinity type steps into our antibody generation process, such as off rate ranking and affinity measurement, um, where really having it in the monovalent format is important to get a clean data set. The downside with doing this is that the monovalent format itself is a low avidity format. So avidity is a function of both affinity, i.e. the strength of the binding site, but also the number of binding sites on a molecule. So if you want a good avidity format, you should ideally go for a, an antibody that has two binding sites on it. So historically, we used to be in a bit of a conundrum when the, the customers would come to us and say, we want the highest possible binding to this target. We would recommend working with the monovalent format to identify the highest affinity clones, and then we'd give those to the customer. They'd tell us which ones they wanted, and then we'd use subcloning to convert them into a bivalent format, which is more expensive and time consuming. Whereas what we can do now is we can generate all the antibodies in the monovalent format, do all the affinity work, identify the highest affinity binders, then rapidly convert the uh, um, format at the protein level into a high avidity format and give it to the customer so that they get the maximum binding strength out of the antibodies we discovered for them. So in terms of the technology that allows us to, to make this rapid protein inversion, it's something called SpyTag. And SpyTag gets its name from strep pyogenes, um, which contains a fibronectin um, binding, or it's a fibronectin binding protein, which in turn um, contains a collagen and adhesion domain. And within this, there's an intramolecular bond between this lysine at position 31 and an aspartic acid at position 117. And this, this 
spontaneous isopeptide bond forms with the reaction energy from a glutamic acid at position 77. And the researchers who first discovered SPITAG, well, um, what they did was they split this domain into a 13 amino acid peptide and a 15.2 kilo, 15 kilodalton protein. And when you, when you recombine these, they, again, this isopeptide bond spontaneously forms and the isopeptide bond is a covalent bond. So it's an irreversible reaction, it's an irreversible linkage. Um, so what this has allowed us to do is to essentially add this spy tag to our fab antibodies and then have a menu of pre-prepared catch domains. And when we recombine them, they, they ligate. The molecular weights are slightly different here um, because we're using a new iteration of spy tag, which, which sort of has a faster reaction rate. But essentially the reaction is spontaneous. It's very robust. So you can do it in a range of pHs, temperatures, salt concentrations, and it can even happen inside cells or inside E. coli cell lysate, which is important for some of our processes. So really the, yeah, the advantage is we make the, we make the fabs with the spy tag on the, on the C term of the heavy chain. We have a menu of pre-prepared catchers. And what this enables us to do is offer the customer not just all the antibodies in one format at the end of the project, but they can receive all antibodies in multiple formats to try in different roles in different assays. They can evaluate them all at the same time. And it also works really well with reorders because the customer can reorder a different format to what they received last time if the needs of their experiment change. Um, if the antibody is going to be used for something completely different, they can, they can reorder the same claim, but in a completely different format. And the, the format options we have there are various monovalent formats where they're labeled additional tags. We then um, link two different catches together. So this acts like a dimerization domain. So then we have bivalent formats again, either naked or labeled. Or we can use the, the catcher domains to add mammalian expressed FC domains. So antibody FC domains onto the antibodies. So you could have a mouse FC, a rabbit FC, a human FC. So these can be used as primary antibodies or serology controls. So there's a, there's a huge amount of versatility we can now offer later in our process. And I mentioned some of these were conjugated. So where we're using um, E. coli express bycatchers, we've um, incorporated uh, basically novel cysteines. So this allows us to do site-specific labeling by malamide chemistry. So one of the advantages is very high um, lot to lot reproducibility in terms of labeling. And if you think about it, what we'll do is we'll, we'll prepare a batch of pre-prepared catcher domain. And then say we generate 10 hits for a customer in a project, all 10 of those antibodies can be coupled to the same pre-labeled catcher domain. So what this will mean is the degree of labeling between all 10 of those clones is identical, essentially. So when the customer is evaluating those 10 clones, any differences they see will be down to the performance of the clone or the antibody binding characteristics. It won't be down to the labeling. Um, which is something which might be different if you do say primary amine coupling to label 10 independent antibodies. Another advantage is because the labeling is done before the fab regions are even added, the customers can be confident that there will be no label incorporated into the binding sites of the antibodies, which can obviously abolish the binding of that antibody. Um, and you see this in this, this diagram here. So what we did was we compared a mammalian expressed clone to the same clone expressed as a fab, um, and then combined with catch domains, either FC catcher or, or E. coli expressed catcher. And essentially what you see is the, um, so the, the mammalian expressed FC is shown in blue on this curve and the catcher ones are shown in red and black. So you get a much greater activity um, with the catcher domains. And we, we hypothesize this is because there's no, there's no label incorporated into the binding site of these antibodies abolishing there their ability to bind their target protein. But this is just direct ELISA. A more relevant format for many customers is the pharmacokinetic assay, where you're measuring usually a drug antibody in a serum sample or, or another type of biological sample. Um, so here, what we've done is we've adjusted, as you saw in the last slide, the greater activity. So it's another comparison study, but we actually used um, four times more of the IgG format of the antibody used in the comparison study than the, than the catcher formats because of this incorporation of labeling to the paratope. Um, and essentially what you see is, is this is our typical pharmacokinetic assay format. So we tend to capture the monovalent fab because you can coat thinly enough that in theory only one, one um, arm of the drug antibody as shown in gold should be bound. 
even the other are binding arm free for detection in a bridging format. And then we use a bivalent secondary because these have a slower off rate. Um, and essentially what you see is very, once you've adjusted the concentration of the secondary, you get very good equivalence. So it shows that the presence of these non-antibody domains in these molecules doesn't have a negative effect. Um, while we're on the subject of pharmacokinetic assays, I want to deviate slightly from the main um, thrust of this conversation, which is the spy tag and just talk about um, a lot of antibody drugs we see now are not classical antibodies, they're not, you know, bivalent fully human IgGs, they tend to be fragments such as ranibizumab, which we, we have anti types in our catalogue to, which is a 48 kilodalton fab fragment specific to vascular endothelial growth factor A. And this slide's quite nice because it just shows how you can use type 1 or type 2 anti types to measure free drug instead of type 1 in these scenarios. So essentially what you do is you'd coat a solid surface with your drug target, you would let your drug bind it, and then you detect with a type three or a type two anti-idiotype, and then you can essentially construct a, a calibration curve for the measurement of these free antibody fragment drugs in, in clinical samples. Another um, common application for our anti-idiotypes is in um, making anti-drug antibody assays, simulating immune response. Um, so very briefly here, what we have is basically a comparison between three different clones um, these are anti-drug antibody clones of medium, uh, sorry, low, medium, and high affinity, essentially. And the assay format is the classical ADA bridging format assay, where you immobilize the drug, you also label the drug, and then an anti-drug antibody will act as a bridge between immobilized and labeled drug, giving you the signal. And essentially what you see here is that regardless of whether they're in a fully mammalian expressed IDG format or an E. coli expressed format, used to an FC domain, um, the performance is very similar. The, the lower affinity control is still low, the medium is still medium, and the high is still high. But it's, I've talked a lot about anti types and sort of that kind of bioanalytical assays in this presentation, but there's also other areas, um, you know, our antibodies aren't just limited to that application. So we're, we're doing a lot of work with companies that are doing cell therapies now. So CAR-Ts are probably the, the most active at the moment, um, and CAR-Ts use a single chain FB to modify the T-cell receptor. So we can easily generate antibodies to those in much the same way as we do for anti-IDs. So this can help customers determine copy number and expression of their CAR-T therapy in their engineered T-cells. Um, but it's not just uh, CAR-Ts we're doing, you know, we're doing um, cells with engineered T-cells, gamma-delta T-cells, NK-cells, and also, you know, endogenous cell surface proteins, um, you know, for the, and the applications of these can be for, you know, isolating particular cell populations or checking to see whether knockouts have been successful. Um, there's, there's a lot of applications. And the reason we can do a lot of this work is because we can also screen by flow cytometry in addition to ELISA. And we can even do our panning and enrichment on cells. So we can block our library with say a non-transfected cell and then we can positively screen on a cell that overexpresses the recombinant cell surface protein of interest. So we can build a lot into our um, antibody generation process. And another big area is gene therapy. Um, so there's, there's, again, there's lots of um, applications for custom antibodies here. It may be that customers want to discriminate between um, different serotypes of a virus, such as a deno associated virus. So here we could, we could block our library with the with the um, serotypes you don't want to cross-react with and then positively select with the, the serotype you do want to identify with. But we can also make antibodies to recognize the, the products of the gene therapy if, if the gene therapy is about inserting a, a novel protein or, a, or, a, or if that protein, if you need neutralizing antibodies to it to simulate an anti-drug antibody response, or even if you're using some kind of cell-free method of making the, the DNA that goes into the cell therapy, and um, you want to look for the proteins that are used in that synthesis because many of them bind DNA as possible contaminants if they're still in the DNA after the DNA has been produced. So, yeah, I mean, really, if you've got any requirements for a custom antibody service, I'd, I'd hope you'd um, bear us in mind because we get all sorts of weird and wonderful requests. So, yeah, I think that brings me close to the end of my presentation. So I hope I've covered a bit about the technology, um, a bit about how we can sort of select strategies to meet particular specificity requirements.
how this new technology allows us to rapidly change formats and how the different formats have various applications in various different roles that are relevant to drug development. So I think I'm still in time. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.